Hello and welcome to episode 152 of the Money to the Masses podcast with your resident expert as always, Damien Fay and me, Andy Leakes. Damien, welcome back. Episode 152, we're back again. We're back again. Yeah, 152, heading towards the 200. It's good to be back, actually. Um, I, I missed our good. chatter this week. It, no, it, it feels, I don't know why it feels longer this week, but uh, how was your week anyway, Andy? Was it good? Yeah, it was quite good. Very busy work-wise for my day job. Um, my boss and a few others were uh, on holiday enjoying the half-term break and uh, I had to step up to the plate and sort of get stuck in. Not that I don't normally, but yeah, it, it just feels like it was a bit of a long week in and out of London and uh, long days. And uh, I managed to get Friday off and spend it with the family, which was lovely. So we went to a wildlife park and uh, yeah, lovely really. How was your week? Uh, it, it was it was good, a bit like you, a bit of the half-term stuff thrown in and I mean, I did something slightly unusual this week. I um, I went into a, an escape room. I don't know if you've ever heard of escape rooms. Yeah, I've done one before. I'll let, I'll let you tell the listeners, yeah. It was a, basically it was a, a, my siblings and my dad actually. And uh, we all went into, it's like, a, basically imagine being in, in a real life Cluedo game. That's what it is. And the one, we, we you go into an event and you get locked into a room and have to solve a puzzle, a crime in this instance in the space of an hour or to be able to, to win the game. It's a bit like Crystal Maze mashed with Cluedo, but you in there. And it was brilliant fun. We solved it with three seconds to go, which... which <laughs> no. There's a picture of us grinning like Wally's next to a countdown where the clock stops at three seconds where we solved it. So um, I won't tell you what it was about because it will spoil it for anybody who ever goes and does these things. But... If you ever get the chance to do it with, like on a works do or with friends, it does sound a bit strange, but going and doing one of these things is really good fun and you get so sucked into the whole drama and pretend and it, it isn't a, you aren't left to your own devices completely. If you get a bit stuck in that hour trying to solve the case, because lots of this, you find something that unlocks a key to a hidden room and combination locks, etc. And... Um, you have a kind of a games master who speaks over a microphone, who's watching you on the camera all the time to nudge you in the right direction. So it's brilliant fun if you get the chance. So it was something very different for me for, for usual. But it was nice to have a bit of a break in one of these, do something that was just pure fun with nothing to do with any sense of purpose. Good. I'm glad you solved it. We, the one we did, we did uh, on a work do, we did a like a, a team bonding type thing. And it was exactly that opening uh, combination locks on trying to find clues and and w- instead of a guy on a microphone it came up on a big screen it just like a, a clue would flash up when he could see or mm. we were struggling and it was good fun but sad to say we didn't manage to solve it in I, the end. I think she was a little bit generous to us at the end I have to admit I think we were at the time but I did set my watch for an hour that set makes me sound like an anorak but you lose track of time and my watch did definitely buzz in a sort of minute before she claimed we'd solved it so i think she was i think she could see we're just about to solve it and do the final thing and i think she was generous so there you go so that was my week uh yeah very entertaining but back to work so what's on the podcast this week andy shall i tell you yeah that's what i was going to ask you what is on the pod this week damien well there's some a bit of a bit of a theme on the first piece we're going to do it's it's nearly halloween and this week i was asked by a journalist for a halloween themed piece they were doing on zombie products and that zombie financial product that you may have lurking in your finances that you need to uh, get rid of. So there's a Halloween piece. I want to talk about something that was a pension. It's really the truth about pensions in a way. I'm going to title this piece. And it's come about as a result of my video series I'm doing, We Need to Talk About Money. And that's exactly what's happened. And uh, a slightly aggressive comment, it seemed, but uh, I got from somebody. Do you know what? Facebook and um, uh, social media is uh, a wonderful place. You do get some great conversation. You do get some slightly barbed comments as well. But it is a good, uh, inspired, uh, a good conversation, which is what I want to bring to this podcast to illustrate and probably highlight a few things that some we've touched upon before, but other other bits people might not quite realise. And the final one is to, to, to highlight to people the importance of, or the impact in particular, that Donald Trump is probably going to be about to have on their finances at least, and maybe in other ways uh, over in America, and to do with the US Federal Reserve, which is their equivalent of the Bank of England. But it's just quite interesting to 
chat about it because people think it doesn't matter. Um, it has limited impact. But I just wanted to chat around that and uh, illustrate to people that it is worth reading some other of these bits of financial news that you see come from across the pond. Good. So what should we start with this week? Well, you choose, Andy. I'll let you choose as my co-host. Let's go for the um, the pension bit and because uh, I'm intrigued as to uh, what this fairly or slightly aggressive comment was because I know exactly what you mean with barbed comments. As someone who puts work out there in the uh, in, into the internet um yeah i write books and stuff and uh, the reviews i get sometimes you just have to <laughs> begin to grow a very thick skin so yeah i'm interested well the piece i did i I done one of the videos i talked about credit and pensions now why people don't pay into pensions and it's something i've touched upon in the podcast before uh the premise is that people don't tend to save do we as a as a nation we're not savers as such and especially young people don't tend to pay into any form of savings account or in particular a pension for their retirement and i sincerely believe everyone's got different opinions and which is what why the world is wonderful but i sincerely believe that one of the fundamental reasons that people aren't even remotely engaged in with pensions is because of the availability of credit so why do you have to save for um, tomorrow we can borrow from it and people are um, encouraged by the uh, availability the excess availability of credit to be honest when i remember being a, an 18 year old and not even having a job and be given a credit card i remember walking through the shopping center down here that blue water in fact is one of the biggest shopping centers in the uk and i was in my early 20s and sign up for a credit card i mean it's crazy the right of credit you could get and damien one of the biggest mistakes i ever made i was at a wedding fair and they were doing a, a, a prize giveaway and i think it was barclay card or egg it might have been egg actually at the time oh hello sir how you doing you can win a, a car if you just fill in your details next thing i know credit card arrived about six months before our wedding expenses built up we had to put stuff on the credit card and that card was there and do you know what it was a very clever thing they got me but i did think it was really irresponsible of them to be doing that to, to such people that really might need that sort of credit and, and be desperate you well know? you say that this is going to link through quite nicely because on that particular credit card i think i was about i must have been about 20 21 at that point and i was miss sold ppi i didn't even know what it was and I didn't even ask for it, but the salesperson obviously ticked the boxes because years down the line, I remember looking at my statements when the bills were racking up and looking at it and uh, thinking, why am I paying about £50 a month? What's this thing I'm paying for? And I mean, I didn't at the time know it was called PPI, but when I rang up, it was like some insurance thing and I said, I didn't ask for it. No refund or anything. But that was uh, obviously something we, I'm going to briefly touch on to uh, a bit later. But there you go. That's how PPI was missold to people. You never knew. But... The, the point is that people don't feel incentivized to save. So I, I put a video out there to explain my view on that, that if you're going to get people to pay into a pension, you need to get them to save first because then they, when they start saving, they may then become interested in investing or paying into a pension. And I got a comment on Facebook, which he, he used, he asterisked the, one of the words. So I'll leave that to your imagination. And he was basically saying that, I didn't know what I was talking about. And um, the reason that people don't ha buy pay into pensions is because they're a rip-off and people you pay into them and then people... Um, I'm paraphrasing slightly what he, what he said, but basically people pay... You pay into them and then you, you don't get what you were promised and then you are left short with a shortfall. And the only way you really want to get people to pay into pensions is if the government actually creates a, a, a product that's guaranteed... And they they take over the investment and will guarantee your um, your pension as, as a result and make up any shortfall. I mean, I love the internet, and this was brilliant. I, I mean, it's music to my ears, uh, really, because it's the whole point of why I'm doing this to try and get people to talk about money. I mean, that wasn't quite a conversation. It was um, I did go back to the guy to have a sort of discuss what he'd written because it was really interesting, which is why I'm bringing it up today. Now. One of the first things to, to point out on that is, as I explained, that the reason I feel credit does hamper people with paying into pensions. But the other thing that was interesting is, is, is there's this understanding of how pensions really work. And there was an element of the, the chap wanted the government to give him a pension. It's the, they should do that because it's the only way it would work and guarantee it. And um, just to illustrate to people that in theory this idea already exists because if you took out a SIP or a pension then you could invest in a gilt or gilt type funds 
And gilts are um, loans to the government, effectively. So you get paid, uh, you invest, say, a hundred grand, and you earn interest until the thing matures. And because they're backed by the government, they're like bonds, but for, to the government, you're guaranteed to get your money back. Uh, because unless the government goes bust, and if the UK government goes bust, then probably your investment is the least of your worries. So you would get the interest. So in theory, it kind of could exist now if people really wanted to, but people don't pay into it. And what it did also illustrate was that, in a roundabout way, what he was describing was almost like the state pension, because we have a state pension and people think that that's guaranteed because you get promised to have a certain amount if you have enough qualifying national insurance contributions. But again, lots of people missed the idea that you have to have enough qualifying years of national insurance contributions. But it's, it's worth me reminding people again that the government can't guarantee even the state pension. They can't guarantee that you and I will ever get one. They can't even guarantee what people get today and they're having to constantly review it because they don't invest the money that comes in in national insurance con contributions directly to pay at the pension of the person who puts the money in. So we've mentioned previously that the, the state pension is kind of like a, a weird Ponzi scheme whereby the people who are paying in now, you, you effectively, when I pay my national insurance contributions, I'm paying for the, the pensioners of today. It's like a, it's a cash machine. I'm putting money in the cash machine and they're on the other side of the cash machine drawing the money out. And of course, the reason I say it's a bit like a Ponzi scheme is because the only way that I'm going to ever get anything out of it, if I can get enough people to pay into it for when I'm there. Of course, I don't, yeah. I don't control that. That's to do with the amount of people who pay tax when I get to retirement, which is a problem that we have as a nation because our population, although it might be growing, it is also aging. So we're getting to the point that you and I, for example, Andy, by the time we get to state pension age, there'll probably be more pensioners than there will be people of a uh, working age paying national insurance contributions because when you get beyond state pension age, you don't pay national insurance contributions anymore. So it's one of those things that we're, that, that shift, that something's got to give. So probably what we'll end up giving is that we'll get paid either less as a state pension or we won't get one at all. So it's not guaranteed in any way, shape or form. And one of the other things, how could you other ways could you get a, a guaranteed pension? And one of them is people would think, well, a final salary scheme, because obviously the gentleman was having a, a have a, was quite upset about paying in to a pension pot that's um, accumulating. The problem is that final salary schemes are a gap. They, they work by you working at a, an employer for a period of time you pay in and your final pension is based upon your length of service and your final salary at that point and accrual rate. So they work it out. And it's usually something like two thirds of your final salary. The point is, in order to achieve that, they have to invest in something to produce that income to generate the fund to grow it because your contributions alone wouldn't be enough to, to, to pay out on the promise that you're going to get that particular pension. So they have to invest in something and typically they invest going full circle back into the things like gilts and the really low risk stuff because they're the only things that can generate anything close to a guaranteed return. So if you wanted something like that, then you're pretty much going to get a very, uh, like if you're going to invest in a gilt or something very low risk, you're potential pension is going to be very low so you are likely to get a shortfall and of course these final salary schemes have all closed because of that because the companies are having to pump in loads of extra money to top up just as that gentleman was suggesting that they, he wanted the government to do of course that's not sustainable so the point is it's really trying to understand how pensions work that you can't have what that gentleman wanted but it was a it, it, i liked the comment and i thought it was great because it allows us to have these sorts of conversations and help people understand and really think about well how am I going to achieve um, the retirement that I want and one of the things is that it doesn't have to be a pension as we've touched upon previously and there's a video I've done about that you could create a side business do something like a blog something like I mentioned in the one giant leap podcast where we interview people who had side projects there's going to be a lot more of that this is the 21st century so we need 21st century solutions they could use ISAs and other savings vehicles. Or you're going to have to just put more money in. That's the other thing. You could put it in cash, but you're going to have to pay a lot more money in. And that's the only other way you can guarantee it. But I understand the man's frustration about the um, concept that you put money in and you just get ripped off. And this 
therefore leads to sort of another um, it, it's true and I understand that and there's been a lot of mis-selling um, I used to work on the um, pensions review at Lloyd's TSB many moons ago where I was actually calculating to the pounds and penny how much people had been um, missold and the compensation they were due and that was my first job outside of university actually just about the time I was taking out excess amounts of credit <laughs> I mentioned that earlier <laughs> but um, which again obviously I, 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 I wasn't a silly silly guy but that's just the way the life works isn't it you're incentivized and encouraged to take out credit and I was young and foolish. So the point is that yes, there are lots of people out there that are um, overcharging and expensive pensions, but the world has moved on and we are in a situation where there are some very incredibly cheap ways to save into pensions and SIP. Some of the robo advice propositions that come about are relatively cheap, far cheaper than they used to be. So it is possible now to invest in passive funds and trackers and things like that at a very low cost. And importantly, to reduce costs further, then it means that if you run your money yourself, you have no one else to blame for your lack of um, pension pot at the end because it's your decision. But you also control costs, so you can keep costs down. So you could theoretically run a pension for less than 1% or well, even less than half a percent of charges a year, 0.5%, where historically you could have been looking at anything 3 4 5% a year in charges which that means you've got to get that additional growth to even just to tread water so it was a, a slightly pointed response but it was exactly the sort of thing that I was aiming for to get people so we can have conversations like this so people can realize that you know what I am the only one who's going to look after my retirement and be responsible for it so I need to take hold of that and I do have options and the one of the key things is to keep costs low but also to realize how much you have to pay in and to do that if you do wonder how much you need to pay in them. If you go to Money to the Masses and um, moneytothemasses.com, we have a retirement calculator on there which you can use. It's free and you can it, try all different scenarios about how much you need to put in and see what kind of retirement that you could get. And the URL for that, if you want to go directly, is calculators.moneytothemasses.com forward slash pension. So there we go, Andy. Uh, it was a really interesting piece generated by social media. We're going to have more of that going forward. I no doubt, as uh, as I do more videos, to get more stuff out there, pushing free content. Before we move on, Andy, I just wanted to quickly mention 8020 Investor. Now, 8020 Investor is my DIY investment service. Do go and check it out. I empower and teach people how to invest their own money. The service provides data-driven fund tables. The data is driven by my own unique 8020 investor algorithm which I created. You also get stop loss alerts, you get research articles and insights, you get market commentaries, monthly commentaries and DIY investment lessons but you also get access to my £50,000 portfolio which is a portfolio of my own money which I run live on the site for members to see and it shows people how I use the service to uh, maximize my returns and in the first two years of doing so I turned £50,000 into £59,500 which is a 19% a return beating investment managers, professional fund managers, financial advisors, investment banks, passive trackers and the market. So everybody can have a free 30-day trial of 8020 Investor and you can claim that by going to moneytothemasses.com and going and clicking on the 8020 Investor hyperlink at the top of the page. So go and try the service, let me know what you think of it and I, I, I know from the feedback that you're going to love it. But for now, on with the show. Right, so Donald Trump then, why is he important and why, why could he impact your potential financial future certainly in the next few months what's up what's what's on the horizon well donald trump is uh, we'd love to ignore the guy wouldn't we but unfortunately <laughs> unfortunately <I try. laughs> unfortunately he has nuclear codes and he has twitter and um he constantly <laughs> is in the, in the news for things he does wrong and things he says but one of the things that despite trying to ignore him you you can't because the world is so connected that, that the US has a very large impact on people in the UK their pension funds their investments and possibly things like their mortgages and going forward and and I'll explain that one of the things that's happening in the, in the very near future is Donald Trump is going to choose the next head of the US Federal Reserve and 
Don't worry if you don't know until what... Until he decides to sack them. Until, <laughs> yeah, until he changes his mind. If you don't know what the US Federal Reserve is, it's the, um, the American equivalent of the Bank of England. So he gets to choose the American version of uh, Mark Carney, who's the governor of our Bank of England. And as the same as over here, the US Federal Reserve meet and chat and they decide on monetary policy, things like interest rates, just like the Bank of England does. Now, at the moment, the US Federal Reserve is already starting to, starting to raise interest rates. Um, it has done in the past because, you know, we were in this big monetary experiment. We were pumping money. The US loved it. They were doing it before anybody else. Like, pump loads of money, print loads of money, lower interest rates. Let's make everybody happy and get things going again. And that has uh, worked to a large extent in America. And it's also driven our stock market incredibly high. We always talk about the analogy with the gardens and hoses and water and puddles but basically if you print enough money it will end up in risky assets and it, that is typically things like the stock market so that's why it's rallied over the last eight years now janet yellen is the current chairperson of the federal reserve and they are on a course of tightening so they're, they're starting to raise rates they're looking like they're going to do it again but they're doing it very cautiously they don't want to rush too quickly because if you do it too quickly then you could end up snuffing out any uh, the the recovery in the economy in the US. But, of course, there's also this juggling act with the stock market. So if you're going to pull away all that liquidity uh, that's been driving the market up, you need the fundamentals to be in place so that are going to keep the, the market high. So basically that companies are actually able to produce the profits that their share prices kind of imply, rather than it just being there's lots of money washing around and people are just putting it in the stock market and driving prices higher easy money tends to lead to that kind of stuff but donald trump is now going to choose the next chairperson and it could be that janet yelling could go back in but when he came into power well before he came into power and he was on the presidential rally trail the campaign trail he was very vocal about how he thought janet yelling was keeping interest rates low to help barack obama as president and keep his popularity high because therefore he should boost the economy and that's like most things Donald Trump does and did he shoots off from the hip and uh, it kind of comes back to haunt him but it seemed to be that for a long time people thought he would get rid of her and now we've got to the point that the most important man in the world is probably going to pick the person for the one of the most important jobs in the world as well which is the Fed, US Federal Reserve chairperson and because we're so interconnected, what they will do, if, if the next person who comes in decides to be particularly aggressive and decides to raise rates very quickly, then we could see the economy start to fall, we could see uh, the stock market plummet, a host of other things. And of course, there's a very um, well-known phrase that goes around the city that basically if America has a cold and sneezes, the rest of the world catches it. So... This has major implications for people over here, and they won't even necessarily know about the U.S. Federal Reserve or who the chair people or the chairperson is. Now there are two other front runners in this, and one of them in particular. We won't worry about the names; it's not quite important. But one of let them, me guess, they're both white males. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. They are. The, the, the other two. Oh, there we go. Then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no no real surprises, but. Um, at the moment, one of the, 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 the gentlemen who is seen as a, as a potential favourite of Trump is, has, well, he has been very, very critical in the past of the US Federal Reserve keeping rates too low. So the suggestion is if he gets in, then we could see rates go up quicker. And if that happens, then central banks have this very bizarre uh, way, I say bizarre, but probably there are a few smoke-filled rooms going on around the place where they tend to follow each other or at least be trying to sing from the same hymn sheet they don't always but if they start to raise rates then it may encourage them to start raising rates elsewhere because um once somebody started it makes it a little bit more palatable the market's already starting to price this stuff in although the exception seems to be japan but that's another story so the point of this piece is that donald trump is about to make a decision that is very important for the market very important for your pension fund very important for um, your investments and those for other people globally, yet we don't hear much about it. But interestingly, the man, this is just a, a, a measure of the man, he went to a Republican um, meeting and asked for people to give a show of hands as to who he, they thought was going to be the best candidate. 
And so something that he only he can decide, he just rocked up and asked people at a meeting, <laughs> just can you stick your hands up for who you like and try and do it like that, which given that that, that people like Janet Yellen has, has, has managed to be fairly sensible and um, negate some of the impacts of Donald Trump, there's been a somewhat of a buffer when it comes to the economy. We need somebody else probably like her uh, again. So it is a worry. So anyway, that, that's why Donald Trump is going to probably once again uh, upset things and you're probably going to notice it. <laughs> From one very scary creature onto another, you talked about zombies earlier. <laughs> what are we talking about? Zombies. Yeah, Andy, zombies. I was asked about zombie financial products. And while well, I don't think there's an official definition of what makes a zombie financial product, but it's really something that's like the undead that comes back to haunt you and um, won't go away and cost you money and you should kill off effectively. And um, I was asked... And it's great timing, obviously, with uh, with Halloween coming up. Yeah, so, it's, uh, you know. so you can you can see how the financial press works. This time next year, they will do the same thing again. And um, they'll probably do something around fireworks or something as well. They do. You, you, mm. you, unless you read the financial press and look for it, they do do themes. And um, there are people who try and sell into these stories because they know they're coming they do work on a cycle in editorial rooms around the uk there's a there'll be a kind of a cycle that they'll go through and re-push out stuff they will get we'll get to christmas we'll have the santa rally again that always comes around it's all the same thing and they sprinkle a bit of fairy dust and update last year's article it always makes me laugh on january the 2nd or january 3rd when i'm making my way back into london and i open the press not the financial press but it's normally on page five or page seven and it's about the uh, the annual price rise of the uh, of the train tickets as you're going back into london and it's the same thing every year everyone knows it's going to be somewhere between two and five percent rises but it's all it fills some column inches and it gives you know gives you the chance to moan about rising prices and like you say it's that cycle isn't it every year so look out for it this year it'll be in the paper again. yeah and the funny thing price rises on the train yeah and the funny thing is a lot of those price rises are based upon rpi that's been an uh, inflation figures that have just come out actually just recently they, they that's how they don't decide it on january they decide it like now back in october and it's how they plan next year's state pension rises so it is they regurgitate the story almost twice because we could have kind of knew what it was going to be in the first place i actually wrote about it in my book because it's it's lazy journalism in a way because like you say people know about it in october november and because everyone's been at christmas and they're eating turkey that's a very easy story to write on december the 20th before before you eat your christmas yeah. dinner and it's ready to go yeah exactly and they do do that and uh, one of the things we I, we have to make sure now andy we don't talk about zombie products next year uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we won't. otherwise we'll be doing the same thing we'll be just doing the same thing we we won't know because we do evergreen content anyway i'm going to run through some of these zombie products i was asked to, some ideas and uh, what i thought about them so i'm going to run through them fairly quickly uh, as i'm conscious of the time ppi is one of them i mean we've all heard about ppi i mean it was designed to cover repayments on debts and loans if you uh, on, or on credit cards if you became ill or lost your job the problem was that they were sold to people who either didn't have jobs or could never claim or the T's and C's were so strict or they were sold to sort of young foolish people like me wandering through blue water. So uh, um, if you have anything like that, then cancel it. And of course, there's the PPI deadline next August on the 29th of August 2019, you've got to be aware of. Um, other zombie products include store cards. Now, store cards, are, you, you go to a shop that clothing companies are uh, particularly bad at it the the staff are incentivized to get you onto a store card so they give you maybe a 10 percent discount to sign you up to a store card but then they have eye-watering interest rates of 20 to 30 percent it's basically credit and now the only time these things work is if for some reason you take the 10 percent discount whether it's up front pay on the store card and immediately clear the balance um, but the I mean, I'm not a fan of them. I don't like that way of... Um, your story you told earlier, Andy, is exactly the reason I don't like credit where you didn't plan to have it, where you can get a card and then you start putting things on it because you needed to, but that's what happens. I just think if you don't take it out, um, then you, you can't get yourself into any dire straits. And the other thing is, people obviously cut the credit card, they'll store card up, but more importantly, make sure you call the card company and actually cancel the account. Don't just cut the card cancel the account um high interest credit cards there's loads of high interest credit cards out there if you can because some i know some of these are high interest because people have had bad credit but preferably try and get onto a 0% card if you can when you switch 
because I was also asked what the cost of some of these products to the average UK consumer. And on the average credit card bill on the UK of £6,400, if you switch from a high interest credit card of say 19.9%, .9%, which is typical of a high interest account, then you could save around £3,000 in interest. And that's taken into account the fee to transfer, which would be about £120. Next one, gift vouchers. How many people have gift vouchers floating around in top drawers or bought them for people? And these are a form of zombie product. Uh, they're not necessarily a financial product you would have bought as such, but they are a... They, they lock your money up and there's normally always an expiry date. And of course, they're worth this after that date expires. So if you've got any, check the expiry date. Spend them before the company goes bust, because if they do go bust, you probably won't get anything uh, back. But more importantly, if you have got them, you want to get rid of them, you're never going to buy something from Topshop that your nan keeps buying you vouchers for. <laughs> you, there are websites like Zeke who uh, will buy and sell these uh, these, voucher co these vouchers. So you go on to Zeke to have a look and then um, try it and get your money back. Extended warranties are another one. Extended warranties are a waste of money. Generally speaking, you always get a one-year uh, guarantee on most products especially electrical products but beyond that there's a, a consumer rights act that uh, consumers rights consumer rights act 2015 actually that states that goods should be of a satisfactory quality fit to do the job intended and last a reasonable length of time and in essence it means if something breaks within six months of you buying it you can take it back to the shop and the onus is on the shop to prove it wasn't faulty when you bought it you don't have to prove anything so um you can just take things back in that, that regard. And typically, these warranties cost around £75. So if you can avoid them, then you've saved yourself money. And sometimes it can add up to um, about 50% of the cost of the thing you bought, which is bonkers. Um, wow. Why would you want an extended warranty on an iron, for example, which I've had someone try and sell me one before. I don't know. Um, packaged bank accounts. Um, certain packaged bank accounts are a bit of a zombie product. There are loads of things bundled up in there for some people they do work joint accounts they tend to work because you get twice the benefit um, but not for twice the price uh, it's normally the same fee but um, check all the insurances and the products that you need them unfortunately the only way you're going to do that is to do a price comparison which is slightly tedious but the biggest one on these is the travel insurance because you need to declare any uh, pre-existing medical conditions. And um, I know I'm obsessed with pre-existing medical conditions, but it's probably because I'm often hampered by my pre-existing medical conditions when I take out insurance. But you need to make sure they are declared on any uh, free packaged travel insurance. So have a look at that. Instant savings accounts are certain ones that... Uh, even the instant access ones that are paying you two fifths of nothing, uh, you can just you can even by getting an extra one percent a year, then that on say five grand equates to about five hundred and forty pounds over ten years. I know that isn't going to make anybody rich, but it you might as well have it rather than the bank. So keep switching around and make sure you keep an eye on uh, bonuses because they have um, teaser rates, don't they? They get you in with a nice bumper bonus extra couple of percent for one year and then that drops down to two-fifths of nothing so do shop around and the last one is child trust funds they were the precursor to junior ices if you remember those and there are plenty of people out there who still have them because you at one point when junior ices came about the child trust funds you couldn't transfer them into junior ices you were stuck and because it was captive money there was no innovation there was no um, from the providers there was no um, improved interest rates their funds were very limited, whereas Junior Isis now, they're much more open. They're, you can invest in a whole range of funds, just like a normal stocks and shares ISA. So um, you're better off moving the money and then uh, maximising it, because I think they're a very good example of a, of a of the zombie product. And um, the, the final thing I would just throw out there before I finish this piece is, if you're looking for these things, check the direct debits on your online banking and your uh, standing orders because there are often these products you're paying for you don't even realize you don't you might not use or you, you even could cancel as a bit of a, of a review and then realize you don't really read that magazine with subscription anymore or you don't need that insurance or gym memberships i mean i think they were uh, a brilliant example of a of a zombie product as it were because there's so many people who have gym memberships they don't use i mean I'm, I'm technically i'm not using mine but that's because i i put my back out <laughs> <laughs> at the gym but hey 
<laughs> we live and learn. I hope to go back. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Damien, that's great. If you want to... Are, are we done, by the way? We, we are done, Andy. We are done. Good. We've had another fantastic couple of reviews in this week. I know we bang on about it every week, but just give us this 30 seconds to please plead with you, the listeners, to get on there and review. It really does help us move up the charts. It helps Damien to spread the word, the good work that he does. So um, just a quick reminder on how to do that, because last time we did this, we got a raft of reviews. So you need to go into... Um, I mean, iTunes is the one that most people use, but go into your podcasting app itself and actually search for our podcast. When you do that, certainly through iTunes, it then brings up the podcast. So type in Money to the Masses on the search. You can then click on Money to the Masses and it gives you the chance there to then click on a review. I think you have to put in a, a username and a, and a quick... I mean, you can put five stars, we don't mind. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anything less and we don't want you. <laughs> yeah, and, and I did have someone get in touch the last time we did this and mentioned that I think if you update to the latest version of iOS on the iPhone, it does enable you to be listening to the podcast and actually leave a review, so you don't have to go oh, wow. quite the convoluted way. Apparently, I've not I've not updated my iPhone because for fear it will turn to a brick and not be. Um, so yeah, you could leave a review for the podcast, but your phone won't work anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, until next week, Andy. Until next week. Don't forget to claim your free copy of Damien's best-selling book, The 30-Day Money Plan. Sort your finances in just five minutes a day, worth $4.99. Just go to moneytothemasses.com slash podcast to find out how.